Thank you so much. Um, I, uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm not there in person. This was the last week of classes, so it was very complicated for me to make it. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about units equivalent machine learning. This is some newer work that is related with some things that I, I talked about in, in past talks that Holger invited me as well. So I want to maybe tell a little story about equivalent machine learning and uh, and convince you that there are many interesting problems in this space for mathematicians like you. Um, so we'll see. And, and also it's interesting in the uh, from the machine learning side, not just uh, from the math side. So this talk is mostly about equivalences and invariants in machine learning models. And the reason why we are interested in incorporating equivalences and invariants is because they provide the correct inductive bias, whatever that means. It's like the correct model for many problems where we know that there's some underlying symmetries in the problems. And if we're going to do machine learning and we want to do some predictions, then it makes sense to incorporate the right inductive bias to the, to the prediction, the machine learning models. We also uh, can prove in some cases that incorporating these equivalences uh, produce uh, better sample complexity in, for the learning problem, small generalization error, and we have some um, evidence that allow us to do some form of out of distribution generalization. And I'm gonna explain what I mean with that in, in um, at, at the end of my talk. Um, but I also want to say that these invariances and equivalences are a source of many interesting mathematical questions. And there's some evidence on that. Uh, there's, for instance, the problem of learning invariances from data is, is a, I think that there's a lot of things to do in that space. Uh, Dustin has a paper that is called EPCA um, with his collaborators, um, but I think uh, that there are many, many other questions that remain open in terms of like, how can we do this efficiently and what kind of things we can prove is kind of like maybe a, a bit uh, like an, a further step from manifold learning, I would argue. Uh, the, other, um, the other interesting source of mathematical questions is how one can design algorithms that explain exploit invariances and invariants. Um, um, and this is a very general question, and I'm going to explain to you how it shows up in questions like graph neural networks, but also with respect to other groups and how one can exploit things that we classically know from invariant theory to, um, to develop algorithms uh, that, that make use of these invariances. I think that there's a lot of things that people do in the in the machine learning community that could be improved and could be um, justified mathematically from from our end. And the other problem that I'm interested in is like quantify in some way how much we gain, maybe in terms of like the sum complexity of the or the generalization error by reducing the space uh, to the space of the invariant functions. And there's some papers in that area. There's a paper by Joan Bruna um, from last year. There's a paper by Montanari from last year. And I'm sure that more things will come in that space as well. Um, so how did I start thinking about invariances and equivalences? Well, I, I think that my first, uh, the first example that, that I came across was this graph neural networks. Uh, example, and I think that um, there's many people from our community that has been working on graph neural networks and thinking about graph neural networks. And here, the the symmetry comes in a very natural way. The idea is that okay, we have a graph. We the graph is an intrinsic object. Uh, you can have many ways of represent the graph that are uh, equivalent. So you can write it as an adjacency matrix of this form, or you can write uh, a different adjacency matrix using a different order 
of the node and of the node. So here, say I, I exchange the order of the yellow and the and the green from this representation to this representation. So basically, what I did is I take the JSC matrix and I conjugated it by a permutation. And so, if I'm going to learn a function like a node embedding, then this function needs to be equivariant, meaning that if I apply a permutation to the input, then the permutation should be applied to the output. That's it. That's the notion of equivalence. So basically you have a group action and if you act on the input by your group, then you have to act on the output by, by the same group. So you need to act by the same group, but the action could be different. Here the action is permutation, here the action is conjugation and here the action is like multiplication, but still um, that's what equivalence uh, means. Uh, another form of symmetry that is much simpler is say uh, invariance. So if I like say in the output, the action is trivial and just say, I want to do a graph classification, then the, the classification value that should not depend on the representation of the graph as a, as a matrix. And so the question in this space is how can we efficiently parameterize the space of invariant and equivariant functions with respect to this action by permutations so that uh, if I want to learn this from data, the representation allows me to uh, learn it independently of the, of the permutation, like the element of the orbit that I chose to represent my, my element. So there are many ways to do this. Uh, the classically, in, in, in most people in machine learning, what they use is this idea of message passing, which is related with the notion of graph convolutions as well. And basically the idea is that, well, for message passing, oh no, uh, for message passing, the, 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 um, each node sends a message to their neighbors and the, the neighbors uh, aggregate the messages that they receive. And that is independent of the representation of the graph as a matrix and that's equivalent just by, by design. Uh, other um, interesting ways to implement equivalence is by observing that actually spectral methods uh, are permutation equivalent. So if I have a graph and I take the top, say the top three eigenvectors, then uh, the eigenvectors are equivalent with respect to this action by permutations. So uh, if I apply a permutation to rows and columns, then the eigenvectors will have the same permutation in the same way. And this is the reason why spectral clustering works, just because it has like the eigenvectors have this property and, and this allows us to maybe design another form of uh, graph neural network or like to another way of parameterizing the, the, the functions on graphs that are equivalent uh, that do not rely on message passing. And basically the idea is to um, learn uh, Laplacian, basically a linear combination of operators associated to the graph, and then do some form of um, function on these objects, like spectral function on these objects that you can write as a, as a graph neural network by unrolling an iterative method. And the point here is saying, okay, there's not, there's not a unique way of implementing equivalent functions on graphs, um, and um, message passing, spectral methods are different ways to do it. And the idea is we want to parameterize functions that satisfy the symmetry. And I may argue that um, doing that for the specific symmetry is not trivial because this is very, uh, it's related with the graph isomorphism problem. Um, and and the graph isomorphism problem is a hard problem. So we don't expect to be able to solve it with graph neural networks in general. And so I can say that actually there is this paper, uh, this, these two works from 2019 that came out at the same time by Shua and collaborators and Morris and collaborators where basically show that if you implement just like vanilla message passing on graphs, then uh, your your, your message passing would not be able to distinguish non-isomorphic graphs that are clearly different. So for instance, if I have a graph 
that is uh, A, which is like two triangles, and I have a graph B, which is basically a six cycle. These two graphs are clearly different, but for every choice of weights of my neural network, you can, you can show that this message passing neural networks would satisfy that for every choice of weight, F of A is equal to F of B. So that shows you, for instance, that message passing cannot distinguish some graphs that are very easily distinguishable by spectral methods, say, or just by very simple methods. And um, we can like understand the expressive power of graph neural networks based on their ability to distinguish non isomorphic graphs. And that's like uh, a very uh, fruitful kind of direction. And we don't expect to be able to solve the graph isomorphism problem with graph neural networks. And we can also use these to, um, to um, show that simple graph neural network architectures based on message passing and others that like maybe I have like some, some kind of taxonomy of different graph neural network architectures that people propose uh, cannot, uh, cannot count simple uh, structures like number of triangles. Clearly this, this uh, message passing will not be able to count number of triangles if, if for every, if, if uh, this, for every choice of weights, this graph has the same value as that graph, but still. Um, and only for like very simple structures, you can do it. And there's other ways that you can um, improve the representation power of these graph neural networks by doing some sort of tricks and techniques that allow you to move beyond counting the type sh shape structures and like beyond being able to distinguish these two things, but still like, it requires some work to understand how to represent um, functions that that are expressive enough and also efficient enough to to parameterize with these with these algorithms. Does that make sense? This. Uh... So uh, today my talk is called Units Equivalent Machine Learning. I'm not going to focus on graphs, though I I'm I'm very interested in, in graph neural networks, but just I'm going to talk about other symmetries that I think are of interest. So symmetries that arise from physics, like for instance, rotation. So I say that I have this dynamical system here and I want to uh, do some predictions of this dynamical system. And I know that if I rotate the system, then the prediction should rotate accordingly. So that's like equivalence with respect to rotations, but also I can think of scalings. So if I scale this system, then the, prediction, the predictions should scale accordingly, et cetera. Uh, there are many other um, groups that one can consider, translations, boost, uh, well, um, and there are other, other uh, groups that, that we care about, for instance, permutations. So these particles are exchangeable. So uh, the order in which I give the particles should not matter. And, and units, so say that the system uh, all these particles have positions and momentums and the positions are given in like meters and the momentums are given in like meters per kilograms, meters per second. Then uh, if I do some sort, of, some sort of change of coordinates where now I'm in the US, so I give all the, all, all the uh, masses in pounds, then I should be able to do the prediction according to that transformation as well. So that's what I'm, that's basically the symmetry that I, that I'm thinking about today. And so the question is the same, is one of these same questions is like, how can we parameterize group invariant and equivalent functions? And just, this is just like what invariant is. If I apply group action to the input, the, the output doesn't change. And equivalent is that if I apply a group action to the input, the output uh, has the same, transformation applied accordingly. And so the way people do this, and I have another slide that I can show you later uh, with a bunch of references. Um, basically, I would say that the way people parameterize group invariant and equivalent functions is based on irreducible representations using group representations. Like I can explain, if I have time, I can explain there how that, how that works. Then this the other, um, um, line of research 
uses group convolutions and weight sharing. This is like papers by Taco Cohen and Max Welling and many other papers that came out later. And my approach is to use the generators of the ring of invariants as, as a way of parametrizing the invariant functions. Um, I, this is something that people in machine learning don't, don't use very much. So I wonder uh, why, but I think that this is a good direction that uh, that is um, that in my in my experience works quite well. Uh, of course, depending on the group, the ring of invariants can be generated by a large um, set of generators. So, for instance, in the in the case that we had before, um, I believe that the 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 the, the ring of 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 invari invariant polynomials for, for this action on, on pairs is actually not fully characterized, but the number of generators grows exponentially or doubly exponentially with the, uh, with the size of the graphs. So that's something that may not be always uh, feasible in practice, but in the cases that we are thinking about, actually, the ring of invariants uh, are generated by a very small, you, like something that we can actually deal with and, and, and is efficient. And so uh, this is the main, uh, the main topic for this work where that is called scales at universal, where we basically show that in order to parameterize um, all the functions that take 10 n vectors in RD and give you a real output that is all the invariant, then you know, and this is like a classical result from invariant theory that says that a function is all the invariant if and only if is a function of the pairwise inner products of the inputs. Right, so you basically, you take the inputs, you, com you compute the inner products and then uh, you uh, you can write your function, your invariant function as a function of the in inputs, and this function can be anything. So it could be any function of the inner products is all the invariant, and any function that is all the invariant can be written as a function of the inner products. And we can extend this for uh, equivariant functions that take n vectors in RD and produce one vector in RD, so that uh, if you apply uh, a rotation to the inputs, then the outputs rotate accordingly. And you can show, and we showed that actually a uh, function is uh, all the equivariant, even only if you can write it as a linear combination of the input vectors where the coefficient functions are, are scale and invariant functions. So basically functions of the inner products. And and that, and you can show that if this is a polynomial, then this fs could be chosen to be polynomials as well. And so this, and then we we can also do something similar for other groups like Lawrence group and uh, special orthogonal group, and also extend it to translations and permutations. But this suggests um, uh, the following like parametrization of the invariant functions. We take the input functions, uh, sorry, the input vectors. We come we compute the pairwise scalars products, and then we can just learn any uh, functions f1 through fn of that, it, that are unconstrained, just any functions. And then these functions are functions of the scalar products. Then each are multiplied by the corresponding input vector, and then they are added at the end. And this is basically the, the output. And so you can, you can learn it in this way, and the and the equivalence is given to you for free because of the invariant theory, uh, the, because the, the fundamental theorem for invariant functions for OD. And so, for instance, we can apply this example to this uh, simulation of this double pendulum that I have here. So I have like these two masses connected by springs. And uh, we know that uh, there is like a kinetic energy and a potential energy. And this, with, if you add them, you get the Hamiltonian. And which is conserved. And, uh, and basically we can, given these ob observations of times and uh, um, of positions and momentums of these particles, we can reconstruct the orbit uh, 
by uh, using two things, two ways of doing it, by learning a Hamiltonian and integrating the Hamiltonian, or by just learning uh, an ODE using just some neural ODE and, and learning the ODE. So I think I have five minutes left. Is that is that correct? Yes, five minutes left. Okay, great. So um, that's good. So we have some simulations and I can go over this later if you want, but just let me, uh, just, I wanted to explain what the concept of unit equivalence is. The idea is that uh, here we are predicting this Hamiltonian. This Hamiltonian has, is, is an energy. So it has units of kilogram meter square divided by second square. So if I do some change of, uh, to scaling to the inputs where like everything Thing that has units of kilograms multiplied by five, then the prediction should be equivalent with respect to that rescaling. And the way you can implement this is by uh, doing um, these units equivalent machine learning that basically uses this classical result from the Buckingham Pi theorem in dimensional analysis that tells you that any function that is units equivalent can be written as a function of like some dimensionless features where then uh, and then uh, you do a, a rescaling in the end. So we construct dimensionless features using something called the Smith normal form. Then we learn some dimensionless label that can be uh, rescaled to something dimensional using a, a scaling with the correct units. And if we apply that to this same double pendulum simulation that I had before, we can show that actually the actually the dimensionless implementation doesn't work as well as the baseline because you have to divide by things like you have to do some yeah some transformations to make the uh the things dimensionless which may be numerically a little bit unstable but we can show that this has a very nice out of distribution generalization performance meaning that i can train my system uh with some training distribution and then uh, evaluate it with a different test distribution and it, the error is much lower just because when you do these transformations from like the inputs to the dimensionless inputs you get um you cover more of the space and i think this can be mathematically formalized and i think this is a very interesting question and it's interesting to the notion of domain adaptation like if you yeah if you have if you have some distribution of your inputs, then you transform them into the dimensionless space, then some distributions that could be very separated in the original input space could become very close together in the, in the dimensionless space. And that's why they actually perform so well in out of distribution generalization. And I have another example uh, in vegetation dynamics where we have a differential equation that predicts the evolution of some of some um, of the vegetation as a function of many many parameters that have to do with like the rainfall and the like saturation constant of this of the of the soil etc uh, and this is like some interesting problem in the context of like climate change and the idea is can we uh, can we predict uh, how how well the how, how whether the, the vegetation will die or not depending on on like on on this model and if we do some predictions based on dimensionless features which which you can compute because you know the units of everything that is involved then you can see that the dimensionless prediction uh, works better. Uh, than, than just like a prediction that doesn't take into consideration that everything that has un everything that goes into your system has units and the prediction should be uh, consistent with the units that everything has. Okay, so the next question that I think is very interesting interesting is how much do we gain by imposing symmetries? And I'm very happy to talk about it, but I'm out of time. So we can discuss it later on, but I think that they're very interesting math problems and like, uh, asking this question and it has to do with like um yeah so say 
say that you have um, a regression and your output is, is not invariant, then what you can do is you can project the output to the invariant space. And if you know that the actual um, system was produced by something that was invariant, you can show that you can always gain something by uh, imposing that invariance. And yeah, uh, I'll discuss that later. Uh, this is my summary. Enforcing exact symmetries have interesting mathematical questions. And I think that they could be very useful for machine learning in the science. And, um, and there are many open problems and applications. And thank you. And I'm sorry, I went one minute.